Hi, I'm Chaplain Bill Goodrich with God Cares Ministry, and I want to welcome you all to this seminar called One-to-One Visitation. It's my heart and goal to help you help residents finish well. And so with that being said, let's begin with a short devotional from the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Out of John chapter 21, we read of this time when Peter, after he made probably the worst mistake of his life uh, by denying Jesus three times, he's he Jesus appears to them and he spends this kind of private time with Peter. And it, it says here in uh, verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon? Son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he, because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And I, I just look at those three words, and I want to just ask us to consider what it means to feed his sheep. What is he saying in this? That that there is there is an a food from heaven that comes from God's word that feeds the soul of every person who would put their hope and trust in Jesus, and so this gives uh, us the it gives Peter, but I believe it's also for us who love him to feed, and then he says the word my. He doesn't say you know, preach a good sermon at the church or go to the nursing home or do this or do, he says, feed my sheep, my lambs. And, and it's so important that we recognize the perspective here because he is talking about something that belongs to him, something that is dear to him and he cares. He's asking this guy who made this terrible mistake, but Jesus knew that Peter loved him and he entrusted this to somebody who loved Jesus, because it was important. It was Jesus's lambs, Jesus's sheep. And Christ, it's a, a phrase that we used to hear a lot, Christ has no body now, but yours. And so we're the hands, we're the feet, we're the mouthpiece for him to feed his lambs and sheep. And one phrase he says, take care of my sheep. And this is what God is calling us to do. And when we remember what he says in Matthew 25, he said about those who were hungry and thirsty and naked and imprisoned and sick. He said, whatever you did to the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. It doesn't say you did this for me. He said, you did it to me. When I see that, I consider that Jesus is so deeply, intrinsically connected with these people that we are serving that he says, whatever you do to them, you did it to me. And the warning to the church is after verse 40, where he says, whatever you did not do to them, you did not do to me. It's, it's a huge warning there, I think. And I just wanted as a kind of a introductory devotional to have us look at this how valuable it is that we are part of this work that is in the care homes there's this uh, other couple of verses i'm not going to read but these would be great for quiet time study and i would encourage you to take the outline after we have this session and to really use the verses as a quiet time study in the mornings or however you do it so that you can really hear from Jesus what he's saying through these many verses we'll be sharing today.
But what I wanted to conclude with now in this devotional is that what we do for care home residents matters specifically to Jesus for all eternity. I know that we want our lives to matter and we want to do something of value and maybe even leave a legacy. This is beyond a legacy because in, in eternity, we will be blessed to be in fellowship with the people that Jesus allowed us to minister to and serve. Is that not awesome? I love it. So I, I want to move on. And my goal here is going to be to talk to you about what my goal is in, in nursing home ministry. And that is I want to help the residents to finish well. It's so important that they finish well. And uh, what that means is they need to know Jesus. They need to be in a relationship with him so that they can grow close to him. Also, in that relationship, Jesus is going to enable them to overcome some of the things that are weighing them down, the unresolved conflicts, the, the, the brokenness. We are not only trying to help these people be saved and to uh, come into a, a, a time of salvation. We're helping them grow closer to Jesus. We are more involved with discipleship than we are anything. And so I wanted to kind of start by uh, talking to you about four primary spiritual needs that the residents have. If we understand these needs, we will be able to help them in, in a great way. So let's start by looking at four primary spiritual needs of nursing home residents. The first one I want to talk about is faith. Faith that leads to a growing relationship with God. Now, when, when a person, or our faith, let me just say, faith is like a garden. It needs water. It needs fertilizer. It needs sunlight. And so I kind of think of the water as prayer, the fertilizer as the word of God, and fellowship in Christ would be like sunlight. And today, as I was preparing and just reflecting on some of these, I thought about this verse in uh, 2 Corinthians. I thought about the weeds that grow in our gardens. And the weeds, the lies, the deceptions, the things that are thrown our way. So many people are embracing a thing, an idea, or a, a belief that does not come from Jesus. And so uh, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, this is not a ruling over people, but this is through the word and sharing it lovingly and respectfully. People, the light bulb turns on for them and they are able to embrace what God said. And that destroys the darkness. The more of, of these prayer, the word of God, fellowship, maybe the weeding of the garden, the deeper our friend's faith in Jesus will grow. So the more of these one has, the more they're going to grow. The next uh, spiritual need that I think is primary to the residents is hope. Hope for tomorrow, like immediate, our, our week, our month, our days on this earth, but also a hope for all eternity. Hope comes from gaining confidence in God's good plans for our future. A person needs to have hope. We can't live without it. And so when a person can gain confidence in God's loving plan for the future, they will have hope. But when people lack hope, they need to be reminded of how much Jesus loves them and that he is faithful to keep all his promises. This is so valuable for them to, you know, we hear that in, in the scripture over and over, these stories of what Jesus did, what he said, what he promised, all those are so valuable 
for our friends to hear. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. But the one thing I want to say in closing on this hope point is that hope must come from the Lord, not in the thing that he promised, but from he himself. Because if the hope is in the things he promised and there's a delay, then we lose hope. But if the hope is in the Lord, then we know that he's faithful and he's capable of keeping his promise. Peace is the third one. Peace that surpasses our circumstances. So peace is rest for the soul, and it's promised by Jesus that if we come to him, he would give us peace. But the problem with his peace is that the thief, the devil, has a way of stealing this treasure. And so the, our friends need to understand how, how do, what does Jesus tell us about receiving his peace and how to guard our hearts from it being stolen from us. Because it can and will be stolen if, our, if we are not guarding our hearts. And that's why Jesus said in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. There's a, this word let I underlined because I believe that we have an ability to allow it. And we also have the ability to guard our hearts. And Christ can show us how to do that. And I'll be talking again more about this pretty soon. The last one here is purpose. A purpose that leads to significance and nurturing fellowship. You see, in, in the care homes, the residents have almost everything done for them. They wake up, their room is cleaned by the aides, their food is given to them. There's no, there's no decisions to be made and they just kind of exist. They spend a lot of time in front of the television and, and the, what I call the purpose muscle begins, begins to atrophy. But purpose will give a person a reason to live. And if they don't have purpose, this is when you hear the statement, which I've heard many times, I don't know why I'm still living. I don't know why God hasn't taken me home yet. But they need purpose. And so we found that our God-given purpose is discovered as we take steps of faith to love God and other people. And this, of course, is all through Scripture. Jesus talks about this in many ways, and he exemplifies it, of course, too. So these are the four spiritual primary spiritual needs. I know that there are other needs, but I, I have discovered this, that if these needs are met by the Lord, then the other needs that they have seem to be less significant, and they almost just have, the, they have this relationship with Christ that he enables them to deal with a lot of it themselves too. But these are the things that I believe we can help them with, and I, I will show you more about that. So, in order to poise ourselves to meet these spiritual needs, we have two primary goals to help fulfill the needs, okay? And so I want to share these two primary goals. The first one is to establish a caring friendship with as many residents as we have time to visit on a regular basis. Friends, this is so essential and critical that this becomes our first primary goal when we walk into a care home. Again, more will be shared about this, but I'm just kind of laying the groundwork for this. Then, and that's, I want to say not also, but then the second goal is what I would call our ultimate goal. And we become very effective when the first goal is fulfilled, and then we work on this second goal. And that is this. As our friends are receptive, help them to take Jesus's hand so that he can give them faith, hope, peace, purpose, and nurturing fellowship. He's the one that does it. He allows us to participate with him. 
I hope that makes sense to you. There are, there's, we published a book, as you can see on the bottom of your outline called Nursing Home Ministry, Where Hidden Treasures Are Found. And we put this together as a handbook so that you would be able to study scriptures related to this and also um, just have a lot of insight on time proven, biblically based and Christ centered uh, principles and tips and testimonies that have uh, we've uh, collected through the years. So I want to encourage you to really take a look at that book and, and purchase it if you are able. And also the other thing is that all the resources we have, they are, uh, we ask that you consider a free will offering in keeping with the fair market value. It costs us to create these, and we, but we also know that sometimes people cannot afford it. We want you to have these resources. So please don't let your lack of ability to pay for something be the only reason to uh, not get them, if that makes sense. Now, what I wanna do is I, I wanna take you to page number three, the next page, and, and we're gonna work on the goals. Uh, the first goal I want to work on is the relationship goal. And so I'm going to give you a lot of tips. Some of this, friends, is uh, kind of basic. And some of it is, uh, you know, maybe new and fresh, or maybe it'll add to what you already know. But bear with me, because we have a, a, a lot of people here, and some are very new to this. And so I want to just be able to kind of do some groundwork. The first one, though, on your paper is prayer. And I want to just say this about prayer. It's so possible that we get used to doing some kind of ministry work that we do it without praying before we involve ourselves with it. I have done it myself. I show up at the nursing home and I'm talking to the people. Things are not going well. Things seem to be kind of disarrayed. I'm a little bit defuddled and all that. And I remember I never prayed before I walk through the door. There's a little saying that you may have heard, when people work, they work, but when people pray, God works with them. The other thing too, is that we see on this uh, number one here, the, the Proverbs three, five, and six, where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will, it's a promise, it's a guarantee, he will direct your steps. The other one too that I wanted to highlight comes out of John 12, 26. To me, this was revelational to my life when I saw the, uh, the principle in this. But in John 12, 26, Jesus makes this statement, whoever serves me must follow me and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And what I have found is that a lot of times we, we want the Lord to follow us. Lord, I'm going to the nursing home. Help me. I'm going to go do this. Guide me. But the Lord wants us to partner with him and follow him. And so if our prayer is more like, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do this? And if we can learn to discern his voice and his, the spirit of God calling us and guiding us in our steps because we've acknowledged him, the, the whole of God Cares ministry is based on those two points that we seek God. What do you want us to do? Even the newsletters, if you get our newsletter, we spend significant time asking God, what do you want to say this time? And we don't say, oh, I want to say this. God, help me say it. Now, I can't say we hit it a home run every time, but we're trying. At least we're acknowledging him doing what he said, right? Okay. Well, I want to go back on the screen and, and uh, uh, share a couple more points here. So, Number two, regard. I, I just want to say that the homes have a lot of rules. It is not always an easy environment to work in. 
but please understand this, that the rules that they have are mandated by the government and they have to do them in order to maintain their license, in order to be reimbursed with the uh, financial needs they have. I want to say, though, that there are times that the homes will do a one size fits all kind of rule system. And there are times that if you respectfully go to the leadership and show them what you want to do, you can ask them if they can work with you if some of the rules are maybe a little bit excessive. And you You've got to be respectful and understand the intent of the rules. And if you go in and say, you know, I understand it's essential that we do this and this, but can we adjust here so that we can accomplish what we're doing? We have seen over the year, uh, particularly since COVID and all, that administrators and um, are willing to work with uh, people if they're approached very respectfully but we have to regard these things if the home is being surveyed and we go in and we do something that violates one of the rules that home can get fined because of us and trust me that won't go well for your ministry okay <laughs> all right so um next one number three visit in teams when possible i find that it's it's good when two people go, even if the two are not in the same room, but the two work together. God Cares Ministry is all about building teams when we can. If you have a desire to work with another person from your church or from some fellowship you're in, as long as they're a follower of Jesus, they love him, and they love older people, we can help you develop a team that works together. But, um, as, as it says here in number three, go in teams of two when possible. When you're visiting in a room, no more than three, because a person can get overwhelmed sitting in a bed with four or five people surrounding them. Of course, unless they know you and they desire it. Um, but yeah, and also, you don't have to be in teams of two. But when you can, and it's appropriate, I see it to be a good thing. Um, a team of believers on the same page can support each other. I have on here one prays while the other one shares. It seems to work that way. Uh, sometimes a resident will like you a lot, but not your partner or vice versa, but you support each other. I love this picture because it really exemplifies what we can do for each other. Now, I don't know who's doing the most work, but the team works together. <laughs> So it says here uh, in from Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. And that's a good principle. Uh, you know, Jesus sent us out in two. And so it's, it's valuable to be embracing that principle. The next thing is respect. The residents lost their home. They live in this little room. And I'm speaking primarily of a skilled care nursing home. We want to make sure that we are respecting them. Knock on their door when you go in. Even if you know them, knock. Give them the option to invite you in. When you go in to position yourself at eye level and straight forward from them so they don't have to turn their head, you'd be surprised how, how much a person's peripheral vision can be diminished over the years. And so make it comfortable for them as much as you can. Never, oh, let me just back up before I do that, uh, talk about that. Um, yeah. I love it. I love technology. I, I, I know it works, but I just don't know how to make it work. Um, when we're talking about being with them in the room, please avoid as much as possible ever sitting on their bed. Never, ever invite yourself to sit on their bed. If it's the only spot in the room that you can sit down, don't sit on their bed. Uh, I'm getting to be a little bit older. I'm in my 60s now, and uh, 
uh, kneeling on my knees has become a little more difficult. And, but I did it for like the first 58 years. And uh, if you can possibly do something like that, learn to get at eye level. If they have a chair, I'll sit in their wheelchair sometimes if they allow me, but please don't sit on their bed if you can avoid it. The other thing is do not approach from behind. Never walk up to a resident and just touch their shoulder when they have not seen you first. The principle is always sight, sound, touch. And if you have it in that order, you will prevent from scaring a person. And that can be really a troubling thing for a person, just to walk up to them, make a loud noise. Hi, Joe. And they haven't seen you yet. So just keep that in mind, please. You want to call them by name, honey and sweetie and things like that is not always appreciated. And if you do these kind of things that we're talking about, you will become a kind and desired friend. And that's what our goal is in this number one. I want to be their friend. I want them to appreciate my visits. One of the things that I have learned over the years is do not assume a resident has unseen physical or intellectual disabilities. Approach them as if there are no inabilities and then make adjustments if necessary. Like we don't make the, we don't, I mean, here's the thing I have shared in, in different seminars, just because a person is sitting in a wheelchair does not mean that they are deaf. You know, we have a tendency to maybe patronize and speak loud and call them honey. And uh, they don't really like that. Some of the residents that we meet in the nursing home are a bit sharper than we are. And uh, this next slide will kind of give you an idea of, of what I'm talking about. It says, honey, I've been through World War II, the Great Depression, taught 3,294 children, administered four elementary schools, and outlived lived every one of the pastors I worked with. I'm 89 years old and you're telling me it's bedtime? I know that was written primarily for staff, but it sure helps us to understand. What are you doing hanging out with somebody who has a lot more understanding and education, even of scripture? And, you know, some people are pastors. Some people, uh, my point though, is that we just cannot assume they don't know. But in the friendship, in the fellowship, we learn who each other is. Is that cool? I like that. Uh, I the openings there. I just I've learned to. Uh, I, I wrote out my greeting that I usually say when I visit somebody for the first time. If I'm going down the hall and I see somebody and they look like they might want to visit, I'll I'll knock on the door. I'll go in and I'll say, "Hey, I'm out here visiting some friends. Is it okay that I visit you?" But learn a way of an opening that's inviting and welcoming to your um, your new acquaintance. You can look around the room and see what kind of pictures or items they have, and they love to reminisce. In our book, uh, Nursing Home Ministry, Where Hidden Treasures Are Found, we have a section that's called, What to Say When You Don't Know What to Say. And in that section, we have a lot of things that you can talk to with them about. And uh, there's things that are just regular, you know, about life and the, their past. But then it gets into spiritual questions, too, that will help allow you to transition into a talk about Jesus. But here's the thing, though. We learn to ask questions, but we also need to learn to listen to what they say. and not not be in a hurry you know oh i i um i i went to i, I don't know i went to uh washington dc one time oh i went to washington dc too and we saw this and we did this and we did you haven't listened oh you went to washington dc great uh what was it like what did you like most 
and just let them share. That's how friends are developed. And so I just wrote, friends listen to their friends. And that would uh, kind of preface this next point on uh, the, the virtue of listening. It's truly, truly a gift to others to know that they're being heard, they're being listened to. I believe that it's possible to hear a person say something, yet not understand or not hear what they said. You hear their words, but you don't hear their heart. And if we are listening and praying at the same time, Lord, let me hear this person's heart. Let me communicate with them in a way that just speaks to what they're sharing. God is able by his spirit to show us and guide us. And it's a beautiful thing. So we do have this, uh, a whole section on this listening skill in the handbook as well. Number 11, I'm going to skip down because, uh, because of time, but number 11, I really want to encourage the, the ability to read things for them if they can't read for themselves. If they can read, read it with them, you know, and I'm talking more about small things like a scripture sheet or uh, some uh, small portion of scripture. I love to put a portion of scripture on like a greeting card or uh, just a one page of scriptures. We have 52 of those on our website, by the way. And we I just love to share those with the residents. They they really appreciate hearing the word of God. So if they can't hear, and the point that I want to make about reading is don't just read it, share it. And the reason why I, I have heard a few times where people would go in and they were sort of on a mission. I got to read this for them. And so they go in, hey, I have something to read for you. Is that all right? Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still water. And they read almost like a like a, a marathon. And the resident just kind of sits there and listens. And then when they get done, they go, thank you. But they didn't hear a word, <laughs> a word that the person said hardly. So just think about the value of just sharing it and sharing it with feeling. Like the Lord is my shepherd. Well, I, this is how I do it. I say, you know, Susan, I have. I have something really valuable, really important to share with you. Do you mind if I, I read this little piece of scripture, this portion? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, it's about Jesus. Let me read it for you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And you see the difference is that we're just letting this come out of us so that it might actually touch their soul and feed them in, in a really gracious way. Touch when appropriate. Some people don't want you to touch them and we need to try to discern that. But I do know this, that residents love gentle hugs. If I see a resident struggling, I'll say, can I give you a hug? And I don't know if I've ever had one say no, but make sure it's not a firm, break their bones kind of hug, but just hug. And then, you know, sometimes I'll say that I needed that too. And let them know that they kind of gave you something too, because they do when they let you hug them. Humor. I think humor is a great treasure for us. And when if we need to be discerning of that too, because especially somebody who's not cognizant and you say something just to be funny, they may not understand what you're talking about and may actually think you're making fun of them. And so you want to be mindful of that. And again, the relationship allows you to understand and discern. So as we're growing in this friendship, we'll know what to do. Finally, I just want to say, give hope. Always be prepared to share God's word in a way and pray with a person as they're accepted. But we offer hope in Christ 
but we never push it. We never force a person with the word of God. We offer it. Hey, can I share this with you? Hey, I have this thought. Can I share it? And allow them to say no. And if they say no, we don't say, well, you know, my whole church is going to be praying for you because you don't really know what you're doing. <laughs> we, we would say, okay, well, I respect that and let it ride. Keep the friendship. In, in my almost 40 years of ministry, I have met maybe five people, six maybe, I'm not sure, that did not want me to share the gospel with them at all. In time, though, and I will say, one lady took like, oh, about two years before she would let me talk to her about the Lord. I got a lady now in one of the homes. She won't even let me in her room. But I'm praying my way in. I'm looking for things that she needs or wants. And she has let me in a couple times. But usually she says, get out of here. And so, uh, you know, it happens occasionally. But my heart and my prayers are that God would speak to her and bless her. Because there's something broken that she would not let somebody in. Maybe I look like the guy that hurt her. Maybe, maybe... She doesn't, you know, she's been hurt so much that it's just not what she wants. But I'm praying that that might change for her because I have something beautiful to give her if I can. All right. So also, I just want to say on the bottom of the page, let us not try to fix a person's lifelong problem in our first 15 minute visit. And this is one of the huge things that happens is we know the Bible so well. And then here's a guy that starts talking about this. And right away, we want to give him these three verses. The Bible, sharing the Bible is essential and we need to do it. But we do not want to be seen as evangelists in the care homes. We want to be known as caring friends, helping residents to find hope and peace in Jesus. And if, if we approach it this way, friends, you will find a welcomed presence in almost every care home. People that have been invited to leave the care homes, they are, are those who have ignored some of these principles that we're sharing today. I... Uh, I have a friend who I, I just wanted to share. I was thinking about Merle as I was uh, looking at these notes today. And Merle was a friend of mine. And he uh, had a religious background. In fact, for about a year, he was a minister in one of the churches. And he told me that after a little while, he learned that, that it wasn't for him. And But when I talked to him about Jesus... He had an openness and a willingness to listen to what I shared, but he would not accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. I would say, Merle, you, you know, you need to you, you need to really understand that Jesus loves you and his hand is held out to you and he's calling you to be with him. But but you have to open your heart in surrender. And he would just kind of get quiet when we, if I talked about anything else, we talked, but when we talked about Jesus, he got quiet. Um, it was a couple months and he ended up in the emergency room and they let me in to be with him, my wife and I, and he, uh, the doctor came in and he basically told him that he was dying and when, after the doctor left, it's kind of a longer story, but after the doctor left, Merle looked at me and said, I think I'm going to need Jesus to get me through this one. And so my wife says, are you ready to open your heart to him? And he said, yes. And we watched this man who stepped back every time we talked to him about Jesus to open his heart. We watched him weep and repeat the prayer for salvation just so sincerely it was a beautiful thing but i want to tell you something if i would have gone in there as my primary goal to get him 
to say the prayer, I don't believe that he would be in heaven today. I just did his funeral on Sunday. And it was a beautiful thing to be able to share with the family how this man took Jesus's hand before he left this world. He lived, he actually lived about five months beyond that time that we prayed. So we had a lot of time to really share a lot of things. And he worked through some of the issues that he had in his heart. And God just really blessed him, helped him finish well, which is the goal, right? Um, let me turn your attention now to uh, page four. Page four. I just have a couple points before we get into this, but establishing caring friendships move us from doing a ministry to being a ministry. And I, I want you to think of Jesus, if you would. He didn't come just to do a cross. He didn't come just to do a, a, a salvation. He became something for us. And he's calling us to become something. And in this mission field, those who become a ministry and the teams that become a ministry have an impact on the entire community of that home. It changes it from a home for the dying to a caring community. And I've seen it. It takes time. It takes work. It takes faithfulness and consistency. It takes a lot of love and prayer. But it happens, friends. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So um, just, to, just to reiterate, to truly be heard, we must first earn the respect and trust from people. And once that's established, then what we're going to share here on this next page is, uh, is going to be a very simple way to help our friends grow closer to Jesus, to take his hand. So we say our ultimate goal, to reach our ultimate goal, is helping our friends to take Jesus' hand. If you look at the top, how can the spiritual needs of our friends be fulfilled? Only Jesus can fully satisfy the spiritual needs of people. It's not something that I can actually do. However, Jesus uses his servants to help point people to him. And if we can point people to Jesus and they take his hand, he'll take them into fulfillment. It's important that we understand the answer to this question. What is spiritual care? We're going into this mission field and we're providing care, but we, we have to understand what is the work of spiritual care. And it's really simple. I mean, someone might say, well, make sure there's church or make sure there's prayer, make sure there's songs. But what I believe an answer to this is, the spiritual care is facilitating a meeting between a friend or friends and Jesus. Jesus said, where two or three gather together in my name, I will be there also. And so if I can create an environment that allows for Christ to be present, then he can do things that I can never do. Because what we're learning to do is to partner with Jesus. We can't give a person hope. We can't give them faith. We can't save them. But we can point them to Jesus through this, this meeting of, of fellowship between us, that our friend, and Jesus. So in what ways can we do this? Well, simply, we know that God's love. He, God is love. So he's present in the love that we have for the resident. We know that Jesus is the word of God, John 1:14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
He said, I am the way and the truth. And he says, your word is truth. All these are verses that help us to know that when the word of God is being shared in the love of God, God is present to that, even if the person is rejecting it. And then finally, focused prayer. And I say focused prayer because it can't just be, I prayed for that person. We need to help them engage in the prayer. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit more. But we need to engage our friend in talking to God. Of course, that's what prayer is. Think about this. If I needed to be saved and you told me about inviting Jesus into my heart, and you said, I'm going to pray that he does that. And you pray that Jesus goes into my heart and saves me. How effective is that compared to me saying, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come in and be the Lord of my life. Make sense? It's not quick Bible verses that address our friend's needs. Although there may be times that we do share a verse that just comes to our mind. But what it really is, is it's relationally sharing the word of God and praying to help our friend take Jesus' hand. I wrote on your paper that people generally want love more than they want the word of God. And that's just the perspective that I have. But I know this, that when they get the love, they'll want the word. And that's what they need. Faith comes from hearing the word of Jesus. And the, and the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of those who will believe him. So I, I'm going to conclude our time with this this uh, portion here that has been such a huge help for me and others that uh, we've been sharing it with over the years. And I, I, the title here is How to Lead Our Friends to Jesus. The first question I have, though, is what does it mean to lead a person to Jesus? And then the second question it's right on your paper. How can I lead a saved person to Jesus? This is important because we think of helping a person be close to Jesus or to take his hand is all about going from not saved to saved, uh, going from uh, an unbeliever to a believer who's now going to heaven. That's part of it. But what about the person who's struggling with an issue? Let's suppose um, you happen to come over to my house in the summertime and the doors open, the screen doors open or screen, you know, it's just screened. You walk up to the front porch and you hear my wife and I having a um, an overly exaggerated, excited conversation. How's that? Some some people call that a, a fight, but I know that if there's any married couples here, none of you have ever done this. But this has actually happened in my life more than once. So uh, let's say you walk up to the door. You never really met me, but you get there and you hear this conversation and, and you think, oh, my gosh, that guy needs Jesus. So if you if you just assume without realizing that. I just, I must not be saved because I would never talk that loud and, and unhappy with my wife. Look how nice she is. She's beautiful. He should be so nice to her. And, and you think, well, I got to lead him to the Lord. Well, I've been walking with the Lord for like 35 years now. Wouldn't that be kind of odd to get in the midst of that? Right? So um, what I need, and here's the thing. I need to be led to Jesus in the midst of my reality. My struggle is my wife is not conforming to what I think she should be doing. Right? So what does Jesus say about it? Unfortunately, she's thinking the same thing of me too, right? That I'm not conforming to what she thinks it should be like. 
I'm kind of, it's all, all hypothetical here. But the point is, is that we can't just look at a person because they're behaving wrong and assume they don't know Jesus. What happens though, friends, is I think we forget who's boss. The worst times in my life is when I forgot that Jesus was boss and I try to take over. And this is when I have the biggest troubles. But in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says to us, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Now, if you think about it, have you been heavy burdened in the last week over any issue? Most of us can say, oh, yeah, definitely. Well, then he's talking to you, even though you're saved. He's talking to all of us. And his promise is that he'll give us rest. So what we did is uh, we took this uh, diagram here, in, uh, this scale, rather. And this is made by a gentleman by the name of Engel. So it's called the Engel scale. And here, this zero represents a person who is saved. Okay, we call that at a zero point, okay, ground zero maybe. And then here, plus four is a person who is not only saved, but they are so right with Jesus, there's nothing they can do to get closer to him. They, they've, they have arrived, okay? And this uh, minus eight is an atheist. He doesn't believe in anything about God, kind of doesn't even believe he exists. He's really far out there kind of weird and then you have all these points between it now what i want to ask before i move is and i know that we can't all talk right here but i want to ask how many of you would say you are a plus four like there's nothing you can do to grow in christ because you're already there and I would hope that most of you would shake your head no, like Nancy's doing right now. Like, no, that's not true. And then I would ask, how many of you are a minus eight? You are so far from believing in God, you don't even think he exists or anything like that. So I would hope that most of you would be saying, no, I'm not there. But I would say between this extreme and this extreme, we all exist. Okay. Now, it's really important to realize that when we walk into a care home, all the people are on this scale, every one of them. But we don't necessarily know if they're over here in this zero place. And what happens is if we're not careful, we kind of do the Gestapo treatment and we say, so, Joe, are you saved? Yeah. Well, how'd you do it? Well, you know, I'm a churchman. Oh, that's that doesn't do it. And we kind of nail them down and say, no, you're not there yet. Or, or you know, we just kind of got this uh, sort of a analytical approach to say whether or not we agree if that person is right with Jesus. Now, some of it is obvious. Some people will say, no, I'm not. And I don't want to be. Or someone might say, I want I want to be, but I'm not sure. But here's the point. When we come in and we meet these people, it's really easy to kind of put ourselves in a place of wanting to get them from wherever they are over that zero mark in the first visit. Because you never know, they may not be there next week when I come. And so I'm going to push hard and I'm going to tell them everything and I'm going to pour it all out. And friends, there are times when that is not the best approach. This lady that keeps throwing me out of her room, that is not going to happen. Uh, you know, what am I going to do? Kind of get in there, close the door so the nurse can't hear her hollering. And I'm going to say, this is the message you got to hear. I mean, that's such an extreme. I know nobody <laughs> would do that, but you understand the point I'm making. So sometimes it's just a little bit. You know, I've had people that said they didn't, they knew that I was a Christian. They didn't want to talk to me about God. And they didn't want me to pray for them. But when they got in trouble, when they were hurting, when they saw that I cared for them and trusted me, they would. I would say, you know what? I, I know that you don't really want me to pray for you. But I, I want you to know that um, I've been seeing that you're going through a hard time. Is it okay that I, I, you know, privately pray for you? Yeah, 
I, I, yeah, that would be fine. Hey, maybe they just moved another notch. Is that a good thing? You know? And so then maybe through that time, and here's the thing. I know because I'm abiding in Christ. I know that he hears my prayers. And I know that he loves that person. And I know that he has sent me to help them. So I got all this good stuff going for me. And I can make assumptions that God is really blessing that person one way or the other. I remember one guy, his wife was sick. I went to the hospital. He wasn't a believer, but I went to visit her and he found out about it. Man, that was huge for him. He wanted me to pray for him too then. So in time, we build these relationships that help them. And, you know, I mean, I've had in my experience a very small amount. I do remember one lady, I couldn't get into her room. There's a couple of reasons, but I just couldn't get to her. And one day a nurse said to me, Maxine would like for you to visit her. And so I went into her room and she said to me, I know that I'm dying and it's not going to be long. The doctor has made that clear to me, but I know that I'm not right with God. Will you help me? Now, that's a that's a wherever she was to over the zero mark visit. I have maybe four or five of those in my 30 plus years. Most of them are like this. We walk slowly together and God blesses it. And eventually, almost every one of them will take Jesus's hand through that friendship. So I want to just kind of, I, I can't do this because I'm on Zoom, but when we have a live seminar, what I'll do is I'll role play with a person and that person doesn't know what I'm going to do. I have two people, actually. I get one and I say, you're going to be Jesus, which makes them very nervous. And uh, then I turn to the other one and I say, you're going to be a, a resident. And then I have a chair sitting there and almost always the resident person will come and sit on the chair. And then I, I give them a hard time because I tell them, that's God's throne. What are you doing? That's what's wrong. <laughs> so anyway, but I, I have the Jesus representation sitting in the chair. And I talk to this resident. And this resident person will just start spilling out what the challenge is. Maybe something that they know actually happened in their last visit. That somebody's uh complaining or or concerned or hurt because of something and we talk about this i listen to that person i i um, ask if i can pray and when that person says yes you can pray for me what i do is in front of the audience i take that person's hand and we walk up to the person representing jesus and i look him in the eye and i say lord my friend ann here is really struggling with whatever it was and I can't help her, but I know that you love her and you will help her. Would, would you please demonstrate to her that you love her, show her that you love her and help her. And almost always without any preparation, that person who's playing the role of Jesus will stand up and hug this person. And when he does that, I let go of her hand and I look at the audience and say, I don't have to carry her burden because Jesus promised that he would help her. It's a very emotive time when we do this because we see that Jesus is, is present to us in a kind of a physical, uh, physical way. It's beautiful. And I want to share that with you because we don't have to save people. We don't have to be the one that does the, the spiritual care. What we do is we partner with Jesus in that effort by pointing them. I want to make clear, too, I was just in a meeting with a group of chaplains, and I would just say from my heart, I don't wait for the resident to ask me about Jesus. I don't wait because they may never do it. But I lovingly, respectfully do things that might open conversation about him. 
one of my friends said, it's kind of like driving. You have the steering wheel, they have the gas and the brake. If they step on the brake, you respect that. And if they keep their foot on the gas, keep sharing. And I thought that was a really good illustration for me to really understand that, you know, they are the, they are the person that determines how far we go with this. And we do it because we are friends first and not um, evangelists. Make sense? So I, we don't have time. I've already gone past my time. So on, on the bottom of page four, I, I wrote out key points. And this kind of summarizes everything that we're just saying today in regard to this visit with Jesus. And uh, I would encourage you to, again, take a look at that and let that be uh, your, your quiet time for a few days. And just really think about and see if you can learn what God is telling us in the midst of that. But I want to say this, friends, that we become most effective as we become skillful at recognizing our friends' spiritual and emotional needs and compassionately sharing what God says in the Bible about how he will help them with that. And as they are open and willing, and we invite them, would you like to pray about that? Of course, if they say no, that's our answer. But if they say yes, then we take them to the throne of God in prayer. The other thing, too, is that I always try my best, and this is so key, I always try my best to encourage them to pray. Friends, if you can get your friend to pray to Jesus, not just you, but them. And so sometimes a resident will say to me, oh, I, I can't pray out loud. Or I can't pray in front of other people. I say, oh, yeah, I know. I was like that for a long time. But you know what? I want to encourage you. I really care about you. And I really trust that God wants to help you. If you ju just pray, Jesus, help me, he'll do it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to pause. And I'm going to give you a chance to pray. And then maybe I'll pray more after you're done. But let's try that, okay? Most of the time, they're willing to do that. And it's the beautiful, it's a beautiful thing because what they do is they, they, I pray and I say, okay, now, Ann, you pray. And it'll be quiet for several seconds and then she'll start. And I'm telling you, I've heard some of the most beautiful, sincere, childlike prayers come from some of these people. And uh, it, it's just, it's heartwarming but I know that I know that Jesus will bless them. So the only other thing I'm going to share, and I know I'm going over time, but uh, we don't always have to be sharing a Bible verse per se. Of course, that's a way to do it. But I want you to know that hymns, devotional stories, just conversation, it doesn't need to be. Well, John 3, 16 says it can be, you know, I have learned in my journey that God loves all people and you can just say things that are biblically sound and your friends will definitely be able to take Jesus's hand. I want to share one more thing here. I just, I remembered, I forgot to share this with you on this, uh, these spiritual needs. We, published a book called God Cares for You. And I, I put that on page five of your handout. Page five gives a little bit of an overview of each chapter. This book addresses all these spiritual needs that we talked about today. And it's written in a way that is kind and respectful and helps the resident to grow. If you are willing to get this book, read it, understand the principles in it, pray the prayers that are in it, read the scriptures that are in it, so you become familiar with answers to these spiritual needs. If you're willing to do that, we'll give you your first one for free so that you can use it as a, uh, a starter, kind of priming the pump for you. But it is a powerful book. Uh, the Lord has allowed it to be 
to, to minister to thousands of residents and we'd like to keep it flowing. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, show you something else on the PowerPoint because on page uh, five, there are a couple blank spots on your outline. And so uh, here's the thing. Jesus promises this to us in John 15. I, I want, I just so desire and want to urge you to read John 15, 1 through 17, maybe about 100 times, maybe, maybe 200, but many, many times in your life because it's so life-giving for the work we're doing. But particularly in verse 5 and 8, I just want to share this, what Jesus is saying. Um, in verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we can do nothing without him. But with him, the promise is we will bear much fruit. The word remain or the word abide, uh, some translations say cling to. You know, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. And so there's this place where we know the Bible, but we also know him. And that's what John 15 is reminding us. It's not just the words, it's him that we're clinging to, abiding in. And the promise is, you will have a fruitful ministry. So I gave you some related scriptures there. Um underneath that but this one verse from verse 8 he, Jesus said this is to my father's glory think about it we as people can bring glory to God and I don't know how that works for you but so God's up in heaven on his throne and I don't really know how exactly how it works but he's like so honored and glorified he looks I don't know if this is true, but he looks at Jesus and says, have you considered my servant? And he speaks of you bringing glory to his name because it says, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And friends, I have approached every one of you as you are believers and disciples of Jesus today, trusting that you are and together me, my staff, my board, the teams that we work with, you, together, we are bringing glory to God our Father through the work we're doing. And I just want to welcome you to be part of that and ask that you would be faithful to remain in him because he wants to do great work in and through you. Amen. Well, uh, it's been a great time to be with you. I know we're at the end of our, our session. And as I said earlier, I will stay on if anyone wants to talk and then we can unmute and chat a little bit. But I'd like to pray a blessing over you before we take off. And uh, let's just bow our hearts. And, and if you can receive this blessing, it's from my heart. And Lord, I want always that my heart aligns with yours and all these people who love you on this zoom meeting and they want to do what's right they don't want to just do something for themselves they want to care for your people your sheep your lambs they want to love them and feed them and i pray your blessing over them that you would give them creative ways and allow them to keep the intent of the laws that are good and that the laws that are not right and appropriate, the ones that are hindering the gospel from going forth, we pray that you would open up the gates that the King of glory may come in and that he who lives in our heart would be able to touch the residents and staff and family members with your love and your good words, your promises, giving them an opportunity to take your hand so I bless my brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, that you will bless them and keep them and make your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them. Lord, help them to understand your pleasure, your delight, your joy, your glory 
that comes from their service, their faithful service. Make your face shine on them, Lord, and give them joy and peace as they look to you and hope to you, hope in you. And Jesus, we ask this all in your holy and amazing name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, uh, as I say to the residents, every time we have a group service, go in peace and remember that God is love and he cares for you. Check out our website. There's a lot of resources for you. I hope that we hear from you. Let's stay connected if we can. God bless you all. Mm -hmm.